Okay, so um, let me just uh, start again with our, our opening um, verse, and that is uh, in, in Ephesians uh, 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And that's, that's kind of been our, our mission statement here, our, our statement of fact that within humanity we all have an untapped, uh, unrealized uh, potential. And uh, that potential is uh, perfected uh, with our relationship with God uh, established through the uh, uh, person of Christ. And um, the, the more we're able to uh, uh, dissolve away and to correct and to... Uh, get rid of any elements of unbelief or false belief, the more likely uh, we are to experience the fullness of what God has for us. And uh, we do that through belief. And uh, just as a secondary verse tonight, in uh, Matthew 19, 26, But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And, um, you know, I found in my, own, in my own life the things that, that I thought were uh, impossible uh, with God because of um, uh, false understanding, misunderstanding, and, and false beliefs that I had, both uh, um, from a religious standpoint and also from a scientific standpoint, all that falsity was, uh, was not uh, an impossibility for God. But that if something appears to be impossible with God, then... Uh, we had better stand back and look at that which we think is an impossibility because uh, it, the impossibility with God does not exist. All things are possible. And I, I, I truly, uh, truly do believe that and have adhered to that. And uh, uh, that's what we want to build is that, that kind of belief and that kind of faith. And we started out by, uh, uh, in the very beginning, talking about... Uh, getting rid of traditional thoughts. And those traditional thoughts, I, I mentioned a, a quote, and I'll, I'll mention it again. This uh, quote is, is the following. You must sit before fact as a little child. Be prepared to give up every preconceived notion or idea and follow to whatever path nature leads or you shall learn nothing. And that is a, an admonition that was given to uh, a group of science students, uh, uh, interestingly enough. And it's the exact same admonition that I think Jesus would give uh, to us as we look at, uh, at his word and we look at his uh, teachings. And that is to give up our tradition. That was the, that was the one thing, the, the greatest obstacle to um, the uh, early followers of Christ in understanding what he was trying to talk to them was the fact that they couldn't give up their traditions. They couldn't walk away from their traditions and open their minds and their hearts and be receptive to the truth. And that's the position that we um, want to accomplish uh, for ourselves because those, that, that is the most limiting factor we have. And it's, not, it's not false belief or it's not really unbelief, but it's a matter of... Um, the, the fact that uh, we adhere to traditions. It's, it's easy to get hung up in traditions. And to a great extent, that's exactly uh, what we're going to be uh, focusing in on as we uh, continue to follow this flow of information. You know, I started out from the beginning saying that the, the whole universe was created by God uh, as he injected information and energy into the universe. That's, that's biblically sound, that's scientifically sound, and there's not many people will argue with that today. That, that's pretty well accepted that information and energy makes up all the universe. And then he created man. And he created all of, all of life. And man being the, the top and the, the pinnacle, the, the top rung of the ladder for life, and, he, and his intention is, is to create this organism, this living being that we have, uh, so that he can have a relationship with us. That's why we were made uh, in, in his likeness and in his image, so we can relate to him. We can love him and he can love us. But, but um, he made us in specific ways to allow him, himself to use the physical laws, the, the laws that govern the physical universe, as well as the laws that govern the spiritual universe, uh, so that those laws uh, can be worked through and God can uh, accomplish his will for each one of our lives as we go through our lives. 
And uh, the, the, the two main uh, constructions that I talked about in terms of a frame of reference to look at life from, one was uh, realizing that we live in a universe that's made up of a spiritual kingdom and a physical kingdom. There's spirit and there's physical kingdom. And uh, it's a simple, simple little diagram, but say, say this, this circle here represents the entirety of, of the universe that, that God created. And this blank space here, and what I'm referring to with this blank space here is just like this vacant space in this room right here. This vacant space in this room is the spiritual kingdom. You can't see anything in there. I mean, I'm waving my hand and I'm not feeling anything. I'm not touching anything. This is the spiritual kingdom. And, and um, we, as physical creations, we make up a very small part. And this is a pie chart, a pie graph of the universe. We only make up... Uh, 0.0001% of the, of the universe is made up of, of uh, physical stuff. And we are that physical stuff. And, and God uh, created us out of all of this. So everything, in, everything that's in this physical part of the universe started from out here in the, the unseen part of the universe. And the, the real... Uh, uh, of course, Jesus, uh, that's what he taught. That's what he taught the disciples and his followers was that this, this was the kingdom he was talking about here. And he talked about that kingdom not only is out here, but that kingdom is also inside here. We have vacant space in our own bodies. Our physical molecules, our cells, uh, are, are not a butting up against one another. They, they literally have... Uh, spaces in them. And I just drew a picture of a cell right here. Here's a cell right here, and this is a nucleus to the cell. And these are these little diagrams. These are little organelles in the cell. There's an endoplasmic reticulum. There's a mitochondria which produces energy. But this is what we're made up of. A hundred trillion of these makes up a human being. But just for simplicity's sake, look at one cell, and we tend to think of that cell being a completely closed structure. Um, and in, in regards to where does the spirit have any uh, bearing on the life and times of this cell, and that is that there, there are, this cell is, is not solid. Remember the quotes that I gave from the famous physicist of, of years ago, uh, 80 to 100 years ago, they, they said that nothing is solid. Everything, everything has, uh, has holes in it. Everything has space in it. So if you, if you shot a a photon through a human being, you could go through a human being with a photon and never hit anything because we're, we're mainly in vacant space. So this cell here has got vacant space in it. So when we talk about the spiritual kingdom, not only is the spiritual kingdom out here in this vacant space, but it's all, it's all it makes us up. We, that, that, it's, it's, that's why Jesus said the kingdom is within. It's all, it's all inside here. So the full reality, the full power of the spiritual kingdom from which everything is derived is, is not only conceptually out here in this vacant space, but it's also within us. We carry this with us. We are, um, the majority of us are just like the universe. We're, we're made up of this vacant space. So, as I said, if you, if you took a, I mean, it's been explained, if you take a, uh, say, here's a, here, here's a molecule right here. And this is, an, this is an organic molecule. This is kind of a benzene ring. It's the substance of most living matter is this molecule right here. These black uh, uh, atoms are carbon atoms. The white are hydrogen atoms. And if you look at this molecule, you can see that there's a lot of vacant space in this molecule. And that vacant space is, this, is what I'm talking about, is this, this right in here. All this area around all of these atoms and molecules is vacant space. And guess who inhabits that vacant space? <laughs> that's, that's where God is. That's where God resides. He resides in this vacant space. So in terms of a personal relationship with God, I mean, not only is, is he a person, but he literally is inside of us. He, 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 is, he inhabits all of these spaces. And the significance of knowing that is, is the fact that... Uh, uh, it should be reassuring to every single one of us that, that uh, not only every one of our, our organs and every bit of our tissue is uh, at the disposal of, of God's hand in his working, but every single molecule, every single atom in our body has vacant space in it that's inhabited by God. And guess what? We are the ones that choose who, who inhabits this vacant space. 
Now, uh, because of what we believe as, uh, as Christians and followers of Christ, we believe that this vacant space, uh, you know, I'd love to think that only God inhabits that vacant space. But unfortunately, th that isn't true. And uh, of course, science doesn't recognize this. And this is where, this is where we depart from conventional science. Science says uh, this vacant space is, is inhabited by a mind. They don't define the mind or don't define the intelligence, but they recognize the fact that there's something out in here in it in this space and they don't define it as good bad or indifferent they just define it as a being well, we know that it's God and we know that there is a, uh, a literal battle that goes on uh, in our lives because this vacant space can be inhabited by God or it can be inhabited by the adversary and God is is our is our uh, source and sustenance for life through Christ uh, of course, the adversary is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And, but we're the ones that choose who it is that, that inhabits this vacant space in here. And that, that's the wonderful uh, uh, freedom that God has given us as, as, as his creation. Is that he's given us a free will, and it's, it's the way we choose to uh, think, act, and feel. And what we choose to meditate on, what we choose to uh, apply ourselves to, that determines what, what inhabits that space. So uh, I hope that everybody see that, that, that from down to the molecular level, God is surrounding us. He's, he's in us. It's, it, God isn't an abstract, uh, far-off God. It's, it, he, he's right here. He's right here in us as well as being all around us. And then last time, we, here, here we talked about this source of information and energy on this diagram here is the Logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, it, it talks about uh, the, the Logos. And then in Colossians, it talks about Christ is the, is the substance of everything. <clears throat> he is what holds everything together. So literally, Christ, the mind of Christ, the Logos, the Word, that, that's what the, the source of all information <clears throat> and energy for the universe comes from this right here. And this, in a conceptualized way of thinking about this, bubbles up. And these, these bubbles come up, and they, they um, come up to the point of, of interacting with us as human beings. And God created us as uh, tripart human beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. And it's our body, soul, and spirit that acts as the interface between the spiritual world and the physical world. And this diagram is, is meant to show that. And I, I said, uh, you know, in, in, our, uh, in our verse in Ephesians, it talks about four dimensions, that when you have Christ, you have not only three dimensions, but you have four, you have four dimensions. So we're, not, we're, we're more than body, soul, and spirit. Uh, I contend that what they're talking about with the fourth dimension is, is our heart. We're, we're body, we're soul, and we're spirit, but we also have a heart organ, our spirit organ. And that's, uh, that's present, and it is associated with all three of the body, soul, and spirit. And there's a, a lot of uh, teaching, and a lot of uh, people uh, try to segregate uh, the, the spirit away from everything else, and you really can't do that because God is everywhere. He's, he's, he's in us. He's between ourselves, in our cells, in our nuclei, in our DNA. He's, he's everywhere. And one way of uh, trying to demonstrate the, the location of the heart is to draw the, uh, the, the, the mind of Christ. Take the spirit, soul, and body out of this diagram here and, and put a, put a, make a cross section here so that we're looking, we're looking at a cross section of this right here. So we have body, soul, and spirit here. And uh, beneath this body, soul, and spirit, we have this big ellipse here, and that is the mind of Christ. Uh, when, when you study out, uh, there are uh, 10 to 13 different words that the Bible uses for defining what the mind is. And, uh, you know, I said last time that the, the spirit is divided into a, uh, three compartments. The spirit is, is where our conscience resides. It's where our communion with God resides. And it's also where our intuition resides. And we're going to be talking a lot about intuition because intuition is the organ through which God communicates with us. And you can understand the, the intuition. Intuition is, is a real thing. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's every bit as present as your appendix is or your tonsils <laughs> or your eardrum. It, it's a real thing. And... Uh, 
it, it's, it's uh, very easy to understand, it's, and it's necessary to understand because that, that's the mechanism by which God literally communicates with us. So those are the three parts of the spirit. And then the three parts of the soul are the intellect, our volition, or our will, and our emotion. Those three aspects represent the soul. And the body is made up of its uh, component uh, parts, all of the organs and tissues and arms and legs and all of our uh, bodily anatomy. And that the state of consciousness is, is uh, what, what we're uh, focusing in on because it's our consciousness that acts as the uh, uh, interface between the physical man and the spirit world is our level of consciousness. And consciousness is extremely difficult to uh, nail down. It's probably the most sought after um, element of study in any aspect of humanity today because man has never had much of an understanding of the consciousness. And I contend that the, the understanding of our consciousness is contained within the Bible. It's what Jesus taught. When he was talking to his disciples, teaching his disciples and followers, what he was literally teaching them about was their level of consciousness. And our three-part system here, our, our body is, is conscious of the world. It's conscious of the environment, of the things around it. Our soul is, is totally self-conscious, only conscious about its own self. And the spirit is our God-conscious area of the body. And when you stack those three levels of consciousness up, uh, the, same, the same word that is used to combine all three of those is the same word that's used in Ephesians uh, where, where it talks about us having the mind of Christ. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. And the mind of Christ is, is not just our spirit, it's not just our soul, and it's not just our body. It's a combination of all three of those things. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, Christianity has gone through the ages uh, of, of information and understanding, there, there have been uh, years and times that religion has, has condemned the flesh so badly that, that Christians thought that, that, that the body was, was evil, that, that the human body was evil. And the human body is, is not evil. The human body is not to be thrown away. The human body is the actual temple of God. It's the temple that God lives in. So why would God make something dirty or nasty in the fact of the human body if that's where he chose to set up residence for his spirit in man? He wouldn't. And our soul is not all bad. Our soul can be used for the goodness of God or it can be used for uh, evil things. It depends on who we're, who we're following out here in this spiritual world. Uh, and, and you can see the different colors here. The blue are, are thoughts and, and ideas and beliefs centered on God. And the red are thoughts and ideas and beliefs centered on the adversary, on Satan. And as, the, as, the, as these... Uh, Thoughts and ideas and attitudes and beliefs percolate up through our whole being, our whole universe. It, it comes into contact with us as human beings. And we let, we let certain of these in to our lives. And that's what, that's what these, these, these gates and channels represent in this diagram here. Through, the, through this uh, mind of Christ that we have comes in, in these areas. And if, if we have the mind occupying this area, well then the, the, red, the red thoughts and ideas can't survive in the presence of the mind of Christ. The two are incompatible. And that's just like um, it's incompatible with a normal, viable, healthy human cell. It's, it's, it's incompatible with the health of a cell to be cancerous. God didn't make cancer cells. The cancer cells have an entirely different, uh, different belief. They have an entirely different vibratory frequency. They have a different chemistry. They have a different everything. And in the presence of, of God, when, when we have uh, completely saturated ourselves with the mind of Christ, then uh, disease and cancer can't exist in the same environment. Now, disease, disease and, and cancer can't exist in the same environment when we, we become saturated with the mind of Christ. 
Okay, so these, these, these three uh, elements uh, give rise then to this whole area of consciousness, which is uh, similar to, uh, as I said, the, the scriptures talk about the mind of Christ coming into us. When we become born again, we take on the mind of Christ, and that mind of Christ has these three elements to it. Well, in addition to these three elements to it, the, the, if, you, if you look at consciousness, one way of defining consciousness is that consciousness has to do with our thoughts. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, teaching and a lot of uh, information that have attributed thoughts, our thought life, only to the emotional aspect of our thoughts. And uh, yes, the emotional aspect of our thoughts can lead us down a destructive pathway, but that's not the only element that makes up a thought. A thought is made up of three things. A thought is made up of, of, a, of an image, it's made up of logic and reason, and it's made up of feelings. And that's important to begin to understand that because we're, we're, we're now building this uh, construct of, of humanity and we're, we're talking about how, how this information comes into us as human beings and that information gets assimilated into us through our uh, organ of the brain and, and the heart. And, and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about and, and from here on out talking about. Because the greatest difficulties in lives that, uh, uh, that we're confronted with um, has to do with the way we're uh, able to manage our levels of consciousness. It, it's our thought life, Jesus said it, it's our thought life that pollutes. It's not what you take in uh, your stomach. It, it's not from your digestive tract. And if you look at our society today, our society is filled with all kinds of things as diversionary tactics to get us away from thinking about our thought life and, and focusing on our thought life. Because if we're thinking about uh, peripheral things that, that make no, have, have no bearing, well, the adversary has, has us right where he wants us. We're, if, we're, if we're chasing around worrying about, uh, uh, if, you know, for the last 50 years and for all of my medical career, uh, I was taught that, that uh, cholesterol was the greatest evil on planet Earth. And, not, and now we find that there are more people dying for lack of cholesterol than ever died as a result of too much cholesterol. I mean, we were totally diverted and totally wrong. <laughs> uh, medicine missed it. They've, they've seen it now, and they, and they are recognizing that, but that's just one example. I mean, I had an associate of mine, he, he, he would just rant and rave on people about how much salt they took in. And I said, why are you such a, uh, so uh, sarcastic and, and so vindictive toward people about how much salt they take in? I mean, it was just unbelievable to me. And he looked at me and said, well, Mark, you got to hate something, and I hate, I just chose to hate salt. And I mean, this, this guy would rip people up one side and other how much salt they had. Well, you know, we, we found out in, in, my, in my career that if you limit salt too much in treating high blood pressure, you actually make high blood pressure worse than, than, than you do anything good for it. So if, as, long as, we're, as long as we have our minds diverted away from the thought life, which is what Jesus said pollutes mankind, then uh, Satan has us. Uh, and he will still kill and destroy. So uh, we, we need to, that's the motivation to understand our levels of consciousness uh, and, and our thoughts. One way, uh, uh, I said last time that uh, the heart is the fourth dimension here, and the heart ha has a way of, of uh, changing locations. It's not a, uh, it's not a uh, static entity. And uh, I'm going to, just get rid of some of this stuff here. Okay, that, that, that first, uh, you know, this, this first elliptical diagram I had here, this, this, is, this, is, uh, the, the, this is the balance here. This is, this is the equal, equal distribution of, of the mind of Christ allotted to the spirit, the soul, and, and the body. All three of those components are contributing equally to this. But as, as uh, I'm sure you can attest to in your, in your own life, there are, there are plenty of times in life that we go through our lives and what this, what this diagram begins to look like on, in a lot of situations is like this. And this is, this is someone who is totally fixated on their body. 
All they're, all they're thinking about, all, all, all they're uh, consuming their life with are concerns, uh, bodily concerns. Now, this, this consciousness, the, this area that, that contains our, our thought life, it, it contain, uh, does touch on all three segments here. But as you can see, it's way out of balance. And you can get just as much out of balance if, if, uh, if you happen to do nothing but sit around all day and think about spiritual things. You can, you can focus and, and uh, saturate yourself with spiritual things to the point where, uh, especially if the spiritual things are related to unbelief or disbelief or wrong belief, you can saturate your life with all kinds of spiritual things. It may look good on the outside, but it's totally, it's totally out of balance. So there is a balance that we're, that we're after here. And this balance has, in the center point, has the, the location of the heart. And, and uh, according to uh, Scripture and according to godly principles, uh, God uh, prefers things to be in balance. It's called homeostasis. It's a rule of biology. It's a basic principle of all biological sciences is that everything uh, attains a level of, of balance. If, you, if your temperature goes up, your body will initiate 15 different mechanisms to try to bring your temperature down. Because your body temperature, your body is made to keep your body temperature at 98.6. So if you get a fever of 104, there's all kinds of things that go on in your body, compensatory mechanisms in your body to bring it back down to balance. The same with, the same with your serum sodium level, the same with your cholesterol level, the same with everything else. The body has all these inborn uh, control mechanisms that correct themselves and they always try to keep things right, right in the center. And right in the center is, is our heart function. And it's the, the reason the emphasis on the heart is that the heart happens to be the organ in the human body that is the organ on the front lines of communicating with God. Because the heart is where faith resides and faith is the language of the spiritual kingdom. If we're, if we're trying to, and we are trying to understand and relate to God, we relate to God by what he cherishes the most, which is what? It's faith. And it, faith resides in the heart. Another way of demonstrating this, I've, I've drawn these three circles here. here. Here's the soul, here's the spirit, and here's the body. And where all of those intersect in, in the center here, this cross-hatched area, it, it's where all of these equally intersect, that's where the heart is. And again, the heart is the source of our faith. Our faith is, is uh, the language by which we communicate with God. So uh, there, should, there equally should be uh, all kinds of emphasis on our studying and looking at the way that we determine and evaluate the function of our heart. And as I said last time, the heart is not only a mechanical pumping organ, but all, all the new science today shows that the heart has literal brain cells in it, and there's a tremendous amount of communication between the heart and the brain. And it's interesting to note that the area of the brain that the heart communicates with is the same area in the brain that if you, if you take a Christian and, and have a Christian start focusing his mind, his focusing his brain, I should say, you have a Christian under an MRI scanner, and you have that Christian start, fo start focusing his brain on faith. He's praying about something, praying earnestly about something, sincerely about something. There's an area of the brain that lights up that shows where that faith is originating from, and it's basically in the right hemisphere of the brain. Well, that's the exact same area that the heart is tied to with all of its 40,000 neurites, which are specialized nerve cells that serve as a communication link between our heart and our brain. It goes right to the right hemisphere. So it's perfectly consistent that the heart is, has such a predominant central role in brain function much uh, different than what we had originally thought, and that was that the brain is constantly telling the heart what to do. Not so. The heart is constantly telling the brain what to do. And the reason for that is because the, it's our heart that does the communication with God. It, it's our heart that, that where the faith, uh, the language of faith originates. It's where, it's where the, the language of faith uh, predominates. And uh, that is what God cherishes most. So our heart function uh, is vitally important. And we, our, our heart function um, has everything to do 
with our uh, success or failure in our relationship with God as well as our relationship with life. You know, whether or not we're able to fulfill what God has for each and every one of us, and, and I, hope, I hope you don't have any second thoughts about the fact that you were conceived of in the mind of God before you were ever conceived of biologically from your mother and your dad. You were already injected into this universe. Your information of your person, your individually specific person was already injected into the universe. God already decided what you were going to do, what you were going to be, and, and everything that his desire was for you. Uh, and and our, our life is meant to uh, li- fil- fulfill that purpose that God has for each and every uh, one of us. And that has to do with our coming to know uh, how we communicate with God so that we can be on the same page with God. Because in the end, it's, it's our ability to, to choose as to whether or not uh, we have a uh, viable, uh, functional relationship with God or not. Well, that's, that's our choice. So... Uh, I hope this, this helps kind of define for you where the heart is in association with the, with the body, the soul, and the spirit because it's an entirely uh, different entity and there's a, there's a different way to look at it today because we've got a lot of new information about this today that wasn't available just 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 8 years ago as a matter of fact. Dr. Armour, the one that's done all this heart research, has just been doing this for the last 5 to 8 years. So that, that's what... Uh, that, that's what we're going to be uh, looking at uh, uh, on the other side of this board. We're going to be looking at, at, at how, how this uh, all begins to function as this information and energy comes into uh, the, re- the receiving organ uh, in our body, which is our brain and which is our heart. So let me just pause here for a second and ask if there are any, any questions about, about this that anyone would like to make a comment about. Yeah, let me see. There, I think there are some uh, microphones on the corners here so that everybody can hear, hear the question. <laughs> um, this is fascinating. But how is it that thoughts can uh, have feelings and thoughts are, can see images? or how? I just don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, That's the thinking. I mean, compared to thinking is what I understand thoughts do, but I don't, how do images and feelings come in with the thinking part? Yeah, we're going to we're going to actually follow the flow of information through the brain to try to figure the answer to that question out. But uh, an, ex- an excellent question. You know, let me, I'll just, uh, just a- ask you this. When I, when I say uh, this word to you, I want you to tell me what, what comes into your what comes into your thought? Apple. Red, round, juicy. Okay. Image. Yeah, an image. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that, that's the image. <laughs> yeah, Glenn. Yes. Yeah, the in, intuition is, 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 and we'll see this and, uh, when I get in and, and talk about the, uh, the uh, internal structures of the brain, the nuclei. Intuition has, has a function uh, where there is a, a, the highest level of integration is associated with intuition of the human brain. The, the heart... It, it's connected, to, it's, connect, it's connected to the heart, it's connected to the soul, it's connected to the spirit, and connected to the body, Glenn. It's connected to all of them. And I think that's my, that's my underlying, <laughs> my hope, I mean, message here, is, that, is that because there's, there's so much misunderstanding about the dynamics that play between all of these things. And, and, that, and, and you know, people have thrown the soul out, they've thrown the body out, and people have just focused in Christianity, that is, in religion, they've just focused on the spirit. And you can't, you can't throw the baby out with the wash. And that's what, that's what the, a lot of uh, people have done. And that leads to misunderstanding. We, we are entities that are made up of spirit, soul, and body in our heart. And that, our spirit, soul, body, and heart is associated with intuition. It's associated with every single thought we have. It's associated with every belief we have. It's associated with every single attitude that we have. 
Okay, any other? Uh... Right here. Oh, Sheila. I'm at the microphone. Okay. <laughs> going to ask is what you talked about with the um, with the Apple image, the image, the logic, and the reason. Could you relate that to um, a person seeking healing of a disease and how um, also the heart um, uh, is, contributes or interferes with that? In other words, like you, like you gave the, um, the Apple image, red, juicy, that type of thing. Could you kind of just give us um, an idea of the image, the logic, the reason with somebody that is approaching this um, uh, seeking healing of a disease. And like I said, is um, how does the heart um, interfere with it as well as contribute to it? Okay, yeah, excellent, excellent question. Let me, I think probably the best, the best way to answer that is, because um, there's a lot that you asked there, uh, kind of the, the, from, 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 the, from the ground floor all the way up. Uh, can I just answer that in a very uh, broad, broad sense? Um, and it has to do with my whole, my whole career and my whole life. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a family doctor, and, I, and I'm a family doctor because I saw real early in my medical training, uh, and I didn't enter into medical training with any kind of background in spirituality or Christian. I was, I was an atheist. I mean, I'd, I'd never gone, had no background in church or anything. And to, to me, the spirit never even existed. I had absolutely no knowledge of it whatsoever. Did, did nothing. Zero. So I went into this to like a virgin uh, territory. Um, but it didn't take me very long to realize that humanity, uh, we as human beings are products of a lot of stuff. You know, we, we are products of, of, uh, of a family. We're products of the community in which we live. We're products of the schools that we go to. We're products of the churches that we're members of. We're products of the county we live in. We're products of the state we live in. We're products of the country we live in. We're product. You see what I'm seeing? What I'm getting at is that uh, how do you throw any one of those things out in terms of its influence on the development of us, of us as human beings? You, you can't. We're 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 an assimilation of all of this information, and every single aspect of this information has a significant bearing on us. So to, to, uh, to your point, how do, how do you uh, relate this to disease? Um, I went back to a community that I was the sixth generation on both sides of my family to live in this uh, community. So I, mean, I, I went, I went uh, because I was interested to know uh, what made me. How, did I, how, how am I what I am? Uh, how did I become what I am today? So I, I discovered a lot of stuff that I had no idea I was ever going to discover. But, but one of the things is the tremendous impact that uh, uh, all of these factors have on our lives. Now, I'll just, n let me just give you an example. Um, uh, Lou Gehrig is a, is a perfect example. You know, Lou Gehrig is, the, is, is who uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is named after, uh, ALS, that, that disease. Well, medicine has no, has, uh, and I, I have taken care of uh, countless numbers of patients with Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, medicine does not know what causes Lou Gehrig's disease. There have been all kinds of theories and hypotheses. Why do people have Lou Gehrig's disease? Um, and you have, to under, you, have to, you have to look at Lou Gehrig in order to understand what causes Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, Lou Gehrig's biography is, is tell, tells exactly what causes Lou Gehrig's disease. And just in short, Lou Gehrig came from a household that he never married. He lived with his mother his entire adult life. Uh, he, he was uh, obsessively, compulsively uh, workaholic and approval-seeking, never, never was assured of love in his life. His dad was an alcoholic who was very uh, vindictive and sarcastic and demeaning and always made Lou Gehrig feel like he was nothing and nobody. And that had a significant impact on, on the way Lou Gehrig developed in his life. And he developed, he beget, developed thought patterns, beliefs, and ideas and an identity about himself that was given to him by his, by his uh, circumstance. Uh, Lou Gehrig, I'm sure, never realized the greatness of Lou Gehrig. <laughs> we all understand the greatness of Lou Gehrig, but, but he never probably understood it himself because that's what causes Lou Gehrig's disease. When you, when you grow up under the kind of stress and duress and the, the kind of uh, feelings of failure and not measuring up and not being good enough, 
Um, you know, here's a man who played baseball, had 17 untreated fractures in his hands. Now, that's, I would call that a superhuman. How many people could sustain 17 fractures in their hands and never miss a baseball game? I mean, that's very unusual, I would say, wouldn't you? I mean, he must have really valued the fact that he had to be out there on that baseball diamond in order to get some valuation for himself. That's where he got his valuation from. That's what made him feel like he was worth something, was that, was that he was always approval-seeking. He was always trying to win people's love and approval. And you take that over a period of years, that has a significant impact on our genetics. It turns genes off and on. When you live under, under condemnation and when you live under doubt and confusion in your mind, in your thoughts, over your lifetime, that has a significant impact of turning genes on and off. It turns bad genes on and turns good genes off. We, we know that today. The whole field is called epigenetics. And uh, over a period of a lifetime, that causes the accumulation of inflammation in the body. In inflammation is the most common cause of disease in our world today. 95% of all human disease is related to stress. What does stress do? Stress causes inflammation in the body. If you inflame cells, cells die when they become inflamed. And that's what Lou Gehrig's disease is. It's an inflammatory disease of the uh, nervous and muscular system. It's, n it's not all that, uh, I mean, it is from, from, from a, uh, not from a source, it's not that much different than multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease or a lot of these other diseases. If there are a lot of cancers that have the exact same origin. I mean, it, it was, I, I remember reading studies from Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute uh, 15, 20 years ago when they came up with the observation that people that die of terminal cancer within two years of their death, they have sustained some significant life stressful trauma. Uh, a, a divorce, a split in the family, uh, a bankruptcy, uh, incest, abuse, abandonment. Something ha has created a significant stress in those people's lives. And how does that work? That, that works through uh, our receiving system through our through our brain and through our heart which is our heart literally sets the tempo for every cell in our body it, it's what sets the and we'll get into this when we get deeper into the heart but the heart literally sets the vibratory frequency of our genetic structure our DNA and, and our DNA our genes are turned off and on based on those those kinds of factors that are going on in each each of our lives so when, when you live under condemnation and guilt and shame over, and I, I, will, uh, I, can, I can walk you through the fact that 95% that of human disease, I think I can relate to shame. Shame. It's the, it's the least understood, the least written about, the most painful human feeling and emotion there is. And nobody writes about it or talks about it because it's so painful. Nobody likes to talk about it. But it's one of the things that I asked God to show me the source of uh, three years ago when I thought I was dying. And, and, and I was. <laughs> I mean, I needed a lot of stuff and, and got a heart pacemaker and a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, when I thought I was dying, the, the thing that bothered me, most, I mean, I've had seven reconstructive spine operations, two heart operations, and all of that stuff, um, and the Lord had seen me through that and allowed me to recover from all of those things. But the one thing that I could not overcome was the feeling of inferiority that I had as a human being and the feeling of shame that I had. And I literally got on my hands and knees and I said to God, you know, God, you're going to really disappoint me if you... <laughs> If I die and I don't understand the origin for this shame that I have in my life, because I've not, I, and I had been a Christian for 35 years at that time, but I still had shame. And I, and I have spent untold thousands of hours uh, in meditation and in biblical study and in scientific study to try to determine what the origin of shame is. And guess what? It ain't all that complicated. <laughs> shame comes from our perception of the nature of God. That's the basis for it, is our perception of the nature of God. And the second component to it is our identity. Who we think we are. 
our personal identity. And that's why I've given, a, I've made available this booklet here, Your Identity in Christ. That's who we are. That's who you are. If you don't believe this, you're opening the door not only to shame, but shame is the basis for multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, certain types of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, unresolved anger. The greatest contributing factor to coronary disease in men is unresolved anger. And you're looking at somebody who died of a heart attack and was brought back to life again. Well, why did I die of a heart attack? Well, I'm here to tell you why I died of a heart attack. The reason I died of a heart attack is that I was with enmity with God for 35 years of my Christian living because I, could, I thought that he was dangling a carrot in front of mankind in the, in the fact that he said that we can become a new creation in Christ, but yet the biological evidence wasn't there to support that, so I, I couldn't believe it. I just l literally couldn't believe it. And then he talks about renewing of the mind. And, the, and for, for 400 years, medical science says you can't change your brain. If you have an insult or an injury from abandonment when you're three years old, then you live the rest of your life with a deficit. Well, what kind of fair system is that? Not, not very fair. So on the basis of those two things, I was constantly angry at God. I mean, we went round and round. And not until I, I got uh, knowledge, biblically, biblically based knowledge of the grace message, the truth about the true nature of God and my personal true identity, that I realized that this is, this is where the answer to these issues are. These life-determining issues are there. That's where they are. You know, it's not in a, I've, been, I've, I've treated every one of these diseases I'm talking about with every molecule you can imagine. And I got news for you. Molecules aren't going to cure them. That, that's not where the problem is. It, it's not a molecular problem. It's a heart issue. Does that answer your question, Sheila? <laughs> yes. Hebrews, you want to read it? Amen. Yeah, let's see. Can we uh, get that mic? Okay, it's um, Hebrews 4, I mean 9, 14. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Amen. That says it. Yeah, our, our, sin, our sin consciousness, I mean, that was a perfectly new, new for, a foreign concept to me. I, I totally missed, uh, missed uh, sin consciousness in Hebrews. I, I, can't, I can't believe I missed that for as many times as I stumbled across it and missed it all. But uh, in, just in the last few years have I come to understand that, yeah, it's, it's, it's our conscience uh, uh, being, convicting us constantly because of our sin consciousness. And as long as we're sin conscious, then, and that's what religion has, has created in us, is that religion has made you think about your sin. You are a sinner. You are a, a dirty, rotten sinner. Well, people don't need to know that. They already know that. <laughs> I've never told anybody in my life they were a sinner that didn't say, well, tell me something I don't know. Every, everybody knows that. Uh, so we don't, need to be aware, we don't need to be aware of that. But, but what happens is, is that you see, the thing that never changes in our, in our human physiology is that 24 hours a day, our brain and heart are functioning. 
It's the, only, it's the only mechanism in our body that never takes a break. 24 hours a day. 70,000 thoughts in 24 hours. Do you know that 90% of those 70,000 thoughts are negative thoughts? And do you know that 85% of them are replicated the next day? So we reproduce those, those 70,000 thoughts, 90% of them, we reproduce them the next day. We rehearse and it's the constant rehearsal of you're not good enough. You're no good. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You know, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it. You didn't, go to, you didn't read enough of the Bible yesterday. You didn't pray long enough. I mean, all of these things that are based on the law, based on performance, and Christ came so that we don't have to perform. Can I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Sorry. Would you please... Uh of what? Of God? Shame comes from our perception of God, is that correct? Yeah, our, our, the, our perception of the true nature of God true and, and our identity of ourselves. Nature of God. You, do you want me to go through that? Yeah, I, say it one more time, the whole thing. Okay, well, I was going to, I was going to show you. Oh, okay. I was going to, let's see, where is that? If you, you know, if you go back to the if you go back to the beginning with, with Adam and Eve, where, where our problems all began, you know, if you, if you go back to that, the first thing that, that uh, Satan created in, in, in Adam and Eve was that, was that he created doubt. God told them who they were, just like he tells us who we are. God told them who they were, but then Satan uh, made an accusation, uh, and it was something other than what God had told them. So they got fouled up on their identity, and they got fouled up because they got into doubt. We used to have a saying in medical school, doubt leads to confusion, confusion leads to hesitation, and hesitation leads to mistakes. And, it, and it, it, <laughs> that, that's as far away from Genesis as you'll ever get, but it's the exact same thing that happened to Adam and Eve. They, first of all, Satan made them doubt who they were, and if he can make you doubt who you are, he's got you. Because you'll believe then what your mother told you you were, or your dad told you you were, or your brother told you you were, an ex-boyfriend told you who you were, or an ex-husband, or the world in some way told you that you're somebody that you're not. And the sad part of it is you believe it. And even sadder than that is that 70,000 times a day you believe it, 90% of those the next day again. Yeah, go. I think I, I, think I, I have. <laughs> yeah. It's got them all tied up. That's a broken heart. Yes, sir. You got it, Glenn. Pardon? Oh, he, he said it sounds like you defined what a broken heart is. A, a broken heart is... is uh, uh, accepting the fact that you are something less than what your identity in Christ tells you you are. A, f a feeling of being uh, inferior, a feeling of being unworthy. Probably unworthiness is the most, is the most prevalent that, uh, that I've found in people's lives. Um, and that state of unworthiness uh, creates all kinds of abnormal behavior patterns. I can, t I can give you a whole litany of them because I, I uh, lived them out in my own life. And they're extremely destructive. It's called committing slow suicide through workaholism, perfectionism, and right on down the line. But don't you think that it was Satan came to them to make them doubt God's love for them. And when they doubted his love for them, that's 
when they started to lose the identity, losing their self-respect, their love for themselves. Yeah. So that, that first happened. That's why he came to, to make them doubt his love. And why God hates sin, shame, guilt, why he hates it is because he knows what it will do to us. And we are the objects of his love. We are the objects of his love. Amen. And that's why he hates yeah. the shame that we feel. <clears throat> he doesn't want that. Yeah, I can, I can just uh, only imagine what God must feel. But I, you know, after taking care of some families in two or three or four generations of that family over a period of 25 or 30 times, I can't tell you how many times I've sat at a bedside and seen someone consuming themselves in a lifestyle uh, of self-destruction and, and thinking to myself, you know, this, this person has every reason to, to live. This person has every reason to succeed. This person has every reason to, uh, to, to have a, a, a true knowledge of their identity, of who they really are, their, their preciousness, how, how much God loves them. But, but they don't. And those that, those that, that I have seen that, that catch on to that, I mean, as close to death as anybody can get, I've seen it totally change the clinical course of their illness just like that with, with a glimpse of who they are in Christ in comparison to who they have thought they were for the last 25 years, which is what's been killing them. I, I can't. I, sorry, I can't. I don't know the, I can't remember the, the address, but Psalm, one, Psalm 139, his, he's, his thoughts are all, he's always thinking of us. That just hit me recently when I read that. He's always, his thoughts are for us. He's always delighting in us. Yeah. He wants, you know, so when we understand that, it brings healing to us, to our souls, our spirit, our body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 uh, just to, to carry on, the, the, first thing, the first thing that happens is doubt. And, and after doubt came, that, then they became fearful. And when, when, when the human brain, they, they, were, they were human, you know, <laughs> they had a human brain. What, what fear does, fear diverts all the blood supply in the brain away from the logical memory center, the, away from a center that it makes you, uh, uh, enables you to make logical, reasonable decisions. So when they were under a state of fear, their reasoning was fouled up. They weren't thinking straight. It's called cortical inhibition. We, I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced it. It's, it's when your mind escapes you and you wonder, why in the world did I say that? Why did I conclude that? I would never have said that in a hundred years, but if you're under enough stress and strain, as they were because they had doubt come into their life, then they got into fear that disengaged their, their hippocampus and they stimulated their amygdala, which are brain centers, then that caused them to sin. And when they sin, that created anger because of their sin, and anger is what caused the shame. But the, the end result is, is the shame that they had as a result of the fact that they realized that they were angry and, and that they had sinned. And uh, Satan, Satan didn't have to give mankind cancer. He didn't have to give mankind addiction or he didn't have to give mankind incest. He didn't have to give mankind uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Crohn's disease. All he did for man was he allowed man to go through this cascade of events to the point that we in, are, are the ones that allow these diseases to become induced in our own selves based on what our perception of God is and our perception of ourselves. Once, once that has been destroyed and disrupted, all the diseases follow suit. Yeah, we'll get more into this in the, in the next hour because I'm going to we start talking about the brain. And I don't know if this will be too big of a question to ask, but my husband isn't here with me this week since he's sick. Um, but I know I've told you before, I have uh, I've battled fibromyalgia for four years and chronic fatigue. And this all has completely made sense to me. Yes, um, what? This all, everything you've been teaching, Mm -hmm. makes complete sense to me, um, just maybe because we've already been studying as a family quantum physics before this. Um, 
But I think my husband would say this is too simplistic, and how could, you know, something like this work? And I'm wondering when you'll get into the application part of it, but I think I'm getting the answer of how do we apply and what's the solution is believing the truth about God and believing the truth about ourselves. And that's where yeah. healing comes? Yeah. Do you, can, do, you want to, do you want me to walk through? Um, I, I've been wanting an opportunity to do this. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. No. Do, do you want me to just take, a, take an example of a patient that I had yeah. and, and give you a little uh, thing and show you how I... How I, I mean, this, this, this patient was instantly healed of a 25-year uh, illness chronic illness, chronic disability, and, and, and she was instantly healed. So, so here, here's, here's this patient that I'd taken care of and, and had uh, unfortunately mistreated and, and maltreated with polypharmacy and all the things that, that doctors do, uh, trying to load up molecules to fix these problems, and, and never came anywhere near fixing this, uh, this uh, uh, individual's problem. She was uh, like a 50-year-old uh, lady that had chronic debilitating fibromyalgia. And uh, she was totally incapacitated by it. And I had tried every single thing in the world to, to, try, to, to try to help her, and uh, nothing, nothing was working. Uh, uh, nothing. And, and I had sent her to a rheumatologist, neurologist, I mean, the whole cascade. I mean, this is a, a billion-dollar billion dollar ordeal here. And, and nothing was fixing this individual. And so uh, as I was going through and, and uh, investigating all of this stuff, and I actually had this stuff in my basement of my house, and I was going through this, uh, I, I called her up and I said, would you, come, would you and your husband come over? I'd like to share some new information I have with you. I wish that I had this 25 years ago. I didn't, but I have it now, so I want to share it with you. I, I owed, owed that to her greatly. So anyway, she, so she came over, and uh, I had... Uh, just, just made this molecule. And I was showing her uh, about how this molecule works, how this, how this works in our, in our body. So our body is this, this is a cell wall here. And these gates and channels are what open and close, allowing the inflow and outflow of life. Things in and out of the, the human body come in through these channels. And what causes these channels to open and close happens to be the information that comes down through this uh, antenna. This is like a TV antenna. This antenna picks up molecules from the environment. A red molecule is a Satan molecule. It's, it's anger, it's resentment, it's hostility, it's jealousy, it's shame, it's guilt. That's what red molecules are. And the molecules of the fruit of the Spirit are blue. Love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. Those, those things, goodness and faithfulness. So those molecules, our receptors are going to pick up something, and whatever it is in the environment, that's what it's going to pick up. So I, I was showing this, this patient this and uh, uh, demonstrating to her that what really ran these cells, these cells, what, made, what was causing her cells to either be sick or to be uh, healthy was whether or not they were opening and closing right and, and how they functioned. But that was based on these molecules that were surrounding in her uh, in her environment, in the internal environment of her life. And uh, I had spent hours knowing this person uh, as well as anybody, but had never actually gotten down to the source, the root source of, of, the, of the issue, the root, the root source of the issue. So as I was explaining this to her about how this, how this is what was going on in her body and her cells, you know, I said to her, I said, okay, when you look at this and you see how this is, uh, what kind of molecules do you have saturating your antennas in your life? If I, did a, if I could stick a pipette into one of your cells and draw out chemicals, what, what would those chemicals be? Would they be? Would they be red chemicals or would they be the chemicals of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And, and she began to uh, get real serious and she said, well, there's no question what, what's saturating my Mom, what's saturating my antennas are all red and, and uh, purple is, is uh, chronic pain and orange is, is resentment and hostility. That, that's what was saturating her uh, antennas. And I said, well, what is the basis for that? Where, where is all that coming from anyway? And, and she began to weep and sob and began to tell me that from, from this high, all she could ever remember was being put down by her family being told that she was never going to mount anything, that she was stupid, that she was dumb, that she was ugly, 
that she was either too skinny or too fat. Nothing was ever right. She was always at a deficit, always at a deficiency. And her husband was sitting there, not saying a thing through this. And, and she looked at him and she says, you know, the only human being that's ever told me that I was worth anything was him. And, and she pointed to her husband. And, and then she said, and you. And a number of years before that, her, husband, her mother had died. And I, I hugged her when her mother died. And she said, you know, that that was the first time that any human being had ever put their arms around me and hugged me was when you hugged me when my mother died. I thought, you mean to tell me you've gone through your whole, you're 50-something years old, you've gone through your whole life, and nobody has ever hugged you and, and given you any sign of, of affection or acceptance or anything? She said, no, never. Never happened. So I said, well, what do, what do you think is, is, is the, uh, uh, causing all of this pain and all of this distress? And, and she said, well, it's all, these, it's all these red molecules. I mean, my antennas are saturated with them. That's what I've lived with. These 70,000 thoughts have, have been nothing but negativity all through her life. That, that's all she ever knew. So as a result, that, that's, that's why her cells were so sick. I mean, she was sick. There's no question about that. And when she came over, she came, she came walking across the room, and she came over to this molecule like that. And I said, well, do you understand that when you were a little, when you were a little kid, your brain was being formed? And when your brain is being formed, if you have abandonment or if you have uh, abuse or if you have uh, unworthiness or shame or guilt, that causes a chemical stress reaction in your forming brain and it literally causes the nerves to, to get eaten away. There's a protein that literally dissolves the nerves away and you end up with a literal injury to your brain. Not, un, not different than a stroke. The exact same thing. It's, it's a smaller than a stroke, but this is an injury here. This is an injury from abuse, abandonment, shame, and guilt. And I, and I said, you know, that for, for 400 years, is we, we've uh, wondered what caused this problem in people's brains, but when the brain is forming early in life, this is, this is what causes it to happen. And when that happens, uh, uh, you can't, you can't uh, transmit your information in your brain. Your brain gets, gets stuck. And nothing is being transmitted here. So you have this deficiency. Well, we never knew that that could actually be changed. And I said, well, do you realize now that that can literally be changed? If you start focusing your, your brain, you start focusing your, your body and your soul and your spirit on the Word of God and begin to saturate yourself with the fruit of the Spirit, do you realize that you can start to knit new nerves into this injury to your brain and you can literally transform your brain. You can repair this process. It's totally repairable. It's been shown with the electron microscope. You can repair that process. And you, you can, you, if, 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 uh, if they've been there long enough, Satan comes in and not only does he have an occasional thought come in and destroy that area of the brain, but he continues pounding away at it and you begin to develop n new nerves that are under Satan's control. And, th and that's, even, that's even worse. But what can happen is if you stop using this, if you stop giving weight to it, if you stop rehearsing it, you stop thinking it, and you replace that thought with a thought from God, you can take this right out. This is called pruning and tuning neurologically, and you can prune and tune your brain, and then you replace that with the thoughts of the true nature of God that are directed by the Word of God, which is where the true power comes in. That's where, that's where all of the regenerative potential comes, is in the Word. Then you've, you've totally taken that, that brain with holes in it from, from all this abuse and abandonment and, and feelings of inferiority and unworthiness and shame and guilt, and you can literally restructure your brain. And you can live the fullness of what God has for you to live. It's every single one of us have this capacity. Every single one of us have the potential to do this. If we only believe it. See, the, 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 the seed, the knowledge just has to be there, and, and the information has to be there, but it's, it's fertilized by belief. You have to believe this, and that's why I'm going through this long 12-week course, so that you believe this. Not, just don't take my word for it. I want you to really believe it. Because if you really believe it, all things are possible with God. Yes. With 
mercury in your mouth, your with heavy metals from vaccines, how does this work into the whole system of getting better? I know as I detox, I feel better. And that doesn't have to do with having a bad childhood necessarily. When you put poison in your body, I mean, how do you heal that up then? Exact, exact same exact same way it's seed time and harvest it takes it takes time you you can you can neurologically repair uh, neurological damage i'm standing here uh, with a spinal cord injury that uh, i should have been disabled in you know in a wheelchair and i'm standing here uh, with a repaired paralyzed bladder and with repaired uh, partial paralysis in my lower extremities because I began to focus my attention on God's Word, and God's Word is a nutrient supply of, of energy to the body, and it will guide, guard, and direct the regrowth of your neurological system. I know it repairs spinal cords because it did mine. Yep. And it does brains, too. <laughs> so it still would be good not to put the poison into your system to start with. Correct? Pardon? You would be better off by not putting the poison into your system. Absolutely. So. Yeah, no question. So, and to go on with my story, so I, I explained this to this patient and, and, and showed this to her, the, this very thing. In fact, she was one of the first times that I, I went through this whole, uh, this whole cascade of things. And uh, uh, when she saw that what, what could happen here, and she saw that who was really in control of, of these gates and channels was, was really her. You know, the, 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 the thing that caused all that was long gone. There wasn't anything she could do about that. Her mother was gone, her dad was gone. Uh, abusive uh, brothers, there was no more relationship there. She, she couldn't do anything with any of that, but she could do something with her. It's just like when God chose to present himself to all of mankind, he just did it through one human. If you can just change your own heart, then you'll change the world. But it all has to start with us changing our own hearts. So when I, ex ex I explained that, I said to her, I said, well, then, uh, what do you choose to do? And I had all these, uh, uh, this whole thing here, sitting here, and she be I didn't even ask her to do it. She began to take these red molecules off and replace them with blue ones. And she went around this whole molecule, this whole cell wall here, and took every red and orange molecule off and replaced it with a blue molecule. And as she did, you could see her go from going from that to, to standing up as a proud human being that had a worth in her life and had a reason and a purpose that she could now pursue. And, and she uh, <laughs> took that opportunity uh, to uh, uh, witness to her uh, to, to activate the, the process through the uh, injection and infusion of the mind of Christ. There's only one way to get the mind of Christ into a human being, and that's through an implementation of the human will by saying, I accept Jesus, uh, and believing it in your heart, and saying it with your mouth. And she, she did that, and, and she, she walked away from this molecule and from this discussion, uh, a new person, a new creation in Christ. And that's been a few years ago, and, and she's, totally fu she's totally functional and, and living a life fitting for uh, the queen that she is. And all the medical science and all the technology and, and all the MRI scans and CAT scans and biopsies, I'm telling you, I mean, all of that stuff uh, didn't come anywhere near touching the basis of the issue. So we all have that, but that's that power. That, that's the power and the potential I'm talking about. Now we're going to take a break and now come back and we're going to start talking about the brain. The brain's on the other side here. Thank you.